The hosts of Isengard roared, swaying this way and that, turning from fear to fear. Again the horn sounded from the tower. Down through the breach of the dike charged the king's company. Down from the hills leaped Urkenbrand, lord of Westfold. Down leaped Shadowfax, like a deer that runs sure-footed in the mountains. The White Rider was upon them, and the terror of his coming filled the enemy with madness. Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today we will be finishing our What's Different series, as it pertains to the two towers, kind of. As I have mentioned before, the timelines of the books and movies are different. As the book ends after Frodo is captured in Kirith Ungul, and Pippin looks into the Palantir after Isengard. But we won't go that far in this video, as we will keep pace with the timeline of the movie, as to make more sense of our comparative timelines. So we will finish talking about the Two Towers movie today, even if we have to pull more from the Two Towers book when we start doing what's different with The Return of the King, as the film adaptation had to move some things around. Hopefully that all makes sense. If you haven't watched the series up to this point, I'll link the playlist in the description and cards, along with some related and helpful articles and other videos. My friends, thank you all so much for joining me today. Let's begin our tale. We will start with the story of Theoden and the Three Hunters and the White Rider. Now in the movie, Theoden and his folk made for Helm's Deep right from the start, while Gandalf actually advised him to ride forth to war. Even though the wizard was unable to persuade the king, Gandalf set off from Edoras on Shadowfax to look for Eomir and his company. But the women and children would also go to Helm's Deep, allowing for some more time with Eowyn than what we get in the book, as well as some other stakes that aren't there in the book. I should also mention that Wormtongue and Sauron have scenes together at Isengard. We also see the vastness of Sauron's army before it departs for Helm's Deep. We also see some of his warg riders and so forth. The movie's tale of Aragorn and Arwen would also progress through flashbacks at this point in the movie, and there would be a battle with warg riders on the way to Helm's Deep. Eventually, they would all make it there, even Aragorn, who nearly perished during that battle. He would spot the incoming army from Isengard and would tell Theoden about it at Helm's Deep. Preparations and character moments would occur as the onslaught came on. However, and this is a major difference from the book, elves would arrive to the aid of the men of Rohan, led by Haldir of Lorien. In the books, Haldir stayed in Lorien with his brothers and presumably fought in the battles of Lorien, but in the movie, the elves would join in this battle and Haldir himself would be slain during it. But ultimately, the Deeping Wall would be destroyed by Saruman's powder and the warriors of Rohan were pushed back into the keep, while the women and children were in the glittering caves. Aragorn convinced Theoden to ride out with him at dawn, and they did so, while Gimli blew the horn of Helm Hammerhand, and then Gandalf arrived with the reinforcements of Eomir's Rohirrim. And so the orcs were defeated and routed, driven into a forest of horns sent by Treebeard, and the main characters looked out over the horizon towards Mordor, knowing that the Battle for Middle-earth was about to begin. Now in the book, things would be pretty different concerning all of this indeed. The company of Rohan would ride far from Edoras across Westfold, and the next day, Legolas and Gandalf forebode some of what came as a darkness with shapes moved across the land ahead of them, and behind them, a storm of Mordor came. They of course were riding out to go to war against Sauron's armies, but plans would soon change. That night, a man came from Urkenbrand's shield wall at the forts of Isen, and he found the riders, thinking Eomir was with them. He told them to return to Edoras, but the shield wall had been broken, and the wolves of Isengard were coming. Theoden, however, addressed the man instead, and wanted to go to the aid of Urkenbrand at the river, but Gandalf, who had been looking ahead, told Theoden rather to seek the vastness of Helm's Deep and the Hornburg, for the danger in front of them was too mighty to overcome. Gandalf would not join them, however, as he made haste going away, and we will speak more of him in a bit. Theoden would lead his armies towards the Hornburg indeed, and as we see, the armies of Saruman were almost on their heels, as they came along not too long after them. And so the Battle of Helm's Deep would take place, and it would be structured differently than it was in the movie. The main leaders from within the Hornburg would be Theoden, Aragorn, Eomer, Gimli, and Legolas. I might even include others, such as Gamling the Old and Hama the Doorward, for Gamling had kept watch over the dike of Helm's Deep in the absence of Urkenbrand, the Lord of the Hornburg, and Hama would do courageous deeds during the battle. For more depth on the battle as it happened in the book, please check out my History of Helm's Deep Region Spotlight, but ultimately, the major parts of the battle 
were when the army of Sauron overtook the dike and came to the walls, when Erdogorn and Eomir led a foray in front of the gate, during which Gimli saved the life of Eomir. And then there was battle atop the walls, the culvert of Helm's Deep was blown up by the black powder of Sauron, Gimli and Eomir protected the people within the glittering caves, and while Hama held the gate of the Hornburg, Theoden and Aragorn led a horse charge from the keep out into the fray, and the horn of Helm Hammerhand was thusly sounded. During their charge, Theoden and Aragorn and the others made it all the way through the dike, and at that very time Gandalf returned with Erkenbrand and his forces as well, instead of Eomir as it is in the movie. And the orcs scattered into a newly made forest of horns and were defeated, while the remaining Dunlendings threw down their weapons and surrendered. Again, it happened a bit different than how it happened in the movie, and the characters were moved around a bit or some new ones were added. Finally, while the bodies of the slain would be seen to and repairs would begin, the King of Rohan slept well for a time after the battle, before the group would go on towards Isengard through the new strange forest, but we'll pick up there with these characters in the next episode. Now we come to Merry Pippin and Treebeard going to war against Isengard, alongside many other Ents. This part is actually quite similar in the movie to the events of the book. In the movie we see how the Ents fought against the orcs and industry of Saruman. They come to break the dam and flood Isengard. In the end, Merry and Pippin find and partake in some well-earned comforts, showing that even the movie version of Saruman had dealings in the Shire, as he got many provisions from that land. But in the book, there is more detail and additions, and even a few changes. While the Ring of Isengard was strong, it was not stronger than the Ents of Yavanna, and with rock and stone, the Ents broke down parts of the walls and rent the gates of the Ring. Knowing more names of the Ents in the book, we find it was Beachbone who burned like a torch during the battle and perished to the sadness of all Ents. After the Ents broke into the Ring and began their devastation, Saruman almost escaped, but was seen in time by the Ents and forced back into his tower. Now at dusk on the same day as the Battle of Helm's Deep, March 3rd, Gandalf actually came to Isengard upon Shadowfax, and he had ridden all the way from Theoden's company in Westfold to Isengard. He was in a great hurry and asked Treebeard for aid, as there were about 10,000 orcs to manage. In this way, Treebeard sent the horns to Helm's Deep, rather than doing that from the beginning of the destruction of Isengard like it was in the movie, and Gandalf was off once again finding Erkenbrand's men who had been driven off from the fords of Isen, and bringing them to Helm's Deep at dawn. Indeed, he needed great haste to accomplish all of this. When Theoden had given Gandalf Shadowfax, it seems that deed saved Rohan, as no other horse east of the sea had that kind of speed to accomplish what was necessary that night. The Ents would eventually break the dams and redirect the water of the Isen through a gap in the northern wall into Isengard, causing great steam explosions and smoke. After some time, the Ents would redirect the water back to its normal course. Grima Wormtongue would arrive and see the destruction, but before he could leave, the Ents forced him into the tower with his master. Now concerning a large narrative change, we actually don't learn about the destruction of Isengard until Gandalf, Theoden, and the others came into Isengard after the Battle of Helm's Deep, and the three hunters get a chance to catch up with their companions, Merry and Pippin. Finally, we come back to Frodo, Sam, and Gollum leaving Ithilien, which in the timeline of events would be days after the drowning of Isengard in the Battle of Helm's Deep. In the movie, of course, there is this whole subplot about Faramir taking the three characters to Osgiliath before coming to understand the true motivations of Frodo and his companions, and the kindness in their hearts, especially after hearing Sam's speech about the great stories. He then let them go by hidden paths out of Osgiliath and into the wilds of Ithilien as they made their way towards Menas Morgul. Frodo and Sam talked about if people would ever tell their stories, and Frodo reminded Sam how much he was needed on that adventure, for Frodo would not have gotten far without him. This conversation here, and Sam's speech about the great stories, were actually quite inspired by a conversation Frodo and Sam had right outside of Shelob's lair in the book, where they talked about how the Silmaril of Baron and Luthien was also connected to their story, for the light of Eärendil in the file of Galadriel was taken from that very Silmaril. Back in the movie, Gollum monologued off on his own about his plans, showing that his devious nature had returned, and then he returned to the hobbits and continued with them towards Mordor. And the Two Towers movie thus comes to an end. Concerning the book version of these events, Faramir gave the hobbits provisions and staves, as well as advice not to drink from water flowing out of the Morgul Vale, for that land was the Valley of Living Death. 
Again, in the books, Faramir was more of a prophetic character, and he told the hobbits that a brooding silence was upon Mordor, and knew not what that portended. Before they made ready to depart Henneth Annun, Frodo said that Faramir was their friend unlooked for, as Elrond said they would find as much on their road. Faramir would allow them to leave Henneth Annun unblindfolded, but Gollum would have to be. Rather, Frodo said they should all be blinded in such a way, mirroring Aragorn's blindfold compromise in Lothlorien. And so they are all led to a safe place in Athelion. Faramir bade the hobbits farewell, kissing their heads and telling them to go with the goodwill of all men. Faramir then went back to his guards, and they made haste from the forest. And so Frodo, Sam, and Gollum continued forth, and Gollum was glad to see those men go, even though they had treated him with more mercy in the book than in the movie. They would continue on to the crossroads of Athelion, but since the movie ended at this point equivalently, we will end our video here and pick up here when we begin our next What's Different video for the Return of the King. From this part of our What's Different series, we see that the greatest of things can only be accomplished with allies and friends. If not for the Hobbit's friendship with the Ents, or Gandalf's friendship with all free folk, or the newly made friendship of the Hobbits and Faramir, our heroes would have come to ruin instead of victory. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope you all enjoyed this episode of our What's Different series. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts, questions, additions, and corrections for this video? Let me know in the comments below. As I always say, I love Peter Jackson's adaptation of these movies, but I also love the depth, lore, and writing of Tolkien that inspired these movies. They are both great in their own ways, as they tell similar stories. There are many differences in The Return of the King, so it will be fun to get into those, as well as finish out these parts of the Two Towers book. To further support the channel, please check out our music channel, Facebook, Twitter, merch, and consider donating to our Patreon for our podcasts and Discord server. Links are in the description below. I want to shout out our Valar tier patrons over on Patreon. Adrian De La Tour, Chris Ortner, Peter Shepard, Lane Grimes, Samuel McBee, Jonathan Putnam, and Mark Kralik. Thank you guys so much, it means a lot to me. Finally, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the Free Peoples today, and I will see you all again next week with an epic character history on Melian the Maya. Everyone, as always, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one, my great friends.